Hello, welcome to this particular module and in earlier modules what we have seen? We have seen how to fabricate an interdigitated electrodes in an SU812 and in my last class what I taught you? I have shown you how to fabricate a gas sensor right. So, in both the cases the idea was that we understand what is the microfabrication process and if you have noticed one thing in both the uh, devices one was your interdigitated electrodes IDEs within the SU8 well and another one was sensor in both the devices the starting wafer was silicon the starting wafer was silicon and on that silicon wafer what we have grown? We have grown silicon dioxide we have grown silicon dioxide. So, how the point is what is a process or what is the equipment that is used to grow this silicon dioxide and whether the silicon dioxide is actually used when we are going to fabricate a MOSFET whether we are going to uh, use the silicon dioxide right that is another question. So, if we are going to use silicon dioxide at in which part of the uh, MOSFETs we can use silicon dioxide right. So, we have to understand what are the techniques or what is what is that particular technique uh, that is used to grow silicon dioxide right. I told you to understand and remember the some words uh, when you talk about the process flow uh, one is you have the substrate we have seen different kind of substrates then another one is we are growing silicon dioxide another one is we are depositing metal another one is we are spin coating the photoresist right then we are developing the photoresist is a uv exposure then there was a etching of metal and there is stripping of photoresist so these are few terms that we have to remember because that is a actual technical terms used when you understand microfabrication Right. So, having said that let us see uh, 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 what are we going to do today, today we are learning the thermal oxidation process. So, if you come back on the screen and if you focus the, uh, the thing that we have seen until now right thing that, that we have seen until now are two devices are two devices. right one is an interdigitated electrodes right in an SU8 well and in both the cases what we have seen there is silicon substrate there is silicon substrate and there is silicon dioxide this is SU8 this is SU8 this is the first device that we have seen first device we have seen number 1. Second device what we saw was a sensor a sensor. with a micro heater on which there was insulator on which there were interdigitated electrodes on which there was sensing film sensing film this is your 
interdigitated electrodes. This is your micro heater, micro heater, this is silicon, this is silicon dioxide, this is silicon dioxide, right, and this one is diaphragm. right this one is diaphragm. So, in both the cases right whether it is a sensor or whether it is an interdigital electrode this is also we can call bio sensor. This is MEMS based sensor why because we have done here what we have done we have etched this much area we have etched this E T C H E D etching. So, this is also called also called when we etch this much we are machining right. If you if you go to workshop and if you want to remove this much material from a metal right this much material which is shown here you, uh, from a metal plate then we can we have to machine that part. Here we are uh, machining at micro scale. So, it is also called it is also called micro machining micro machining right. So, the point that I am making here is that in both the cases one thing that we have seen is the silicon dioxide right. We have seen silicon dioxide which is grown silicon dioxide which is grown on the substrate the substrate is silicon in this case it was silicon right. So, this much we have learned. Now, what we have to see is how this silicon dioxide we can grow, how silicon dioxide we can grow. So, in this particular lecture we are focusing on, so now you see we are moving towards understanding the integrated circuits, how we can fabricate or how we can fabricate a MOSFET how we can fabricate a MOSFET right and then we will go to the op amp and then we will see their applications. We will see their applications uh, I have lot of experiments for you guys to see how we can use operational amplifiers, how we can use operational amplifiers and form several circuits, several circuits. I will also show you how MOSFET looks like, how op amp looks like, what kind of equipment we require to actually demonstrate the use of the op amp. Whether it is an oscillator or whether it is a multi vibrator again it is a part of oscillator or the offset characteristics or the characteristics of op amp offset input voltage or uh, input bias current right Inpu input offset current um, uh, uh, how we can understand the virtual ground right, how inverting amplifier can be used, how non inverting amplifiers can be used, how filters can be used. There are several type of filters that I have uh, as, as a part of the experiment that I will show it to you right uh, uh, from several filters low pass filter, high pass filter, band, band pass filter, band reject filter right. Then uh, uh, we have some simulation to for you to show. So, this is how it will help you to understand how we can apply the knowledge of your indicator circuits, your MOSFETs, your op amps uh, into actual actual kind of circuits and how you can really design the circuits, how you can design the circuits and how you can check the circuits, how you can evaluate the circuits. So, that will be part of the uh, experiment series uh, which is part of this particular uh, course. So, not only you will learn the uh, basics of how to uh, how to fabricate or how to design a process flow for fabricating a MOSFET, but you will also learn uh, along with understanding the op amps that how you can apply those op amps, how you can apply those this, this knowledge into the experimental uh, designs. Right. So, uh, uh, coming back to this particular lecture we will look in this lecture thermal oxidation, we will look thermal oxidation all right. So, next two lectures uh, we will be focusing more on uh, the fabrication part and then uh, uh, sometime around the end of an another two lectures we, you will be able to understand how you can fabricate a MOSFET or how you can at least draw the process flow for fabricating a MOSFET. 
all right. So, uh, uh, let us see here what, what, what kind of thermal oxidation we can perform. What we see? The first thing that we see is that in the IC industry, in the IC industry, what is IC industry? Integrated, integrated circuits. circuit industry in, in, in the integrated circuit industry what we find we find that the if you can change depending on the thickness of the oxide depending on the thickness of the oxide you have different applications you have different applications now you see uh, if you can see on the screen what you see is that if you want to use the uh, uh, thermal oxidation or sio2 you can use it as a thermal oxide or you can use it as a filled oxide, you can use it as a filled oxide if your thickness is around 1 micron. Thickness is around 1 micron you can use as a filled oxide. If a thickness is around 0.1 micrometer you can use as a masking oxide, masking oxide right. Now, we have seen a ex, uh, example of masking in the in the fabrication that when we wanted to edge the wafer, when we wanted to edge the wafer from the back side from the back side what we have done we created uh, we grown we have grown silicon dioxide we have grown silicon dioxide and and then right the silicon dioxide we have grown correct and then what we have done we have we have created a window we have created a window what was the window window we created on the back side in the second example like this and then I told you that now we can etch it using wet. So, the silicon we can etch using wet or dry etching right this is I, I had told you in the last class. So, when you etch silicon nothing happens to this particular layer or, or the silicon below it right this is the silicon below this SiO2 this is your SiO2 this is your SiO2 and then the rest of the sensor is over on the top is, is here right. So, here when we dip this wafer in either wet or dry etching, so either we perform wet etching or we perform dry etching, what will happen? The silicon, the silicon will get etched, if it is dry etching we will have the something similar structure right. If it is wet etching then, then we will obtain a diaphragm which looks like this. This angle is angle created is 54.7 degree, 54.7 degree when you are using wet etching. But the point is what the point is that if we use SiO2, this silicon here is not getting affected, it is not getting getting etched. If you use SiO2 here, the silicon here is not getting etched. That means the silicon dioxide, the silicon dioxide X as protecting oxide it can protect this layer uh, from getting etched it can protect this layer from getting etched right. So, this is what the uh, uh, purpose of the oxide can be another way is when you want to deposit uh, uh, when you want to create the uh, uh, diffusion layer diffusion. So, or N and P type of diffusion uh, let us say this is N type wafer and you want to create a P type for source and drain right. So, this areas if you remember for the MOSFET this is dopants right dopants source and drain how you will create source and drain right. So, in this case in this case for creating source and drain what we will do we will have the oxide we will have the oxide this is n type silicon we will have oxide on top and on bottom on top and bottom and then we will open the window we will open the window that means we will remove the oxide using our photolithography technique using our photolithography technique that is your spin coating and then pre baking and then exposing with the mask and then unloading the mask then po developing then post baking and then etching the uh, silicon dioxide. I also told you to etch silicon dioxide we can use 
BHF it is buffer buffer hydrofluoric acid buffer hydrofluoric acid this is the acid that we can use to edge the silicon dioxide right so the point is that if i have if i have this sio2 and if i want to diffuse now diffuse or ion implant diffuse or ion implant the source and drain region source and drain region then i will do the ion implantation like this right ion implantation or diffusion any process you can use then this area which is protected by the oxide this area which is protected by oxide this area which is protected by oxide this will not get diffused see the, the open cannot enter this it open cannot enter the silicon dioxide or it will not the silicon dioxide will protect the silicon from getting diffused because it will act as a mask it will act as a mask mask so i have shown you two ways one we can use the silicon dioxide as a mask in sensor now this is a silicon dioxide that that you can use as a mask during the doping of during the doping of p or n type source or drain right p or n type source or drain right and that's why sio2 if it is around 0.1 micron this can also work as a masking oxide also worked as a masking oxide so first uh, role we have seen of silicon dioxide field oxides second role of silicon dioxide masking oxide right third role of silicon dioxide third role of silicon dioxide is to use as a pad in the pad oxides hmm? third role is for the pad oxides then we have fourth role which is somewhere between 10 nanometer and 1 nanometer we can use this as a gate oxide or tunneling oxides gate oxide or tunneling oxide you know that in mosfet we when we when we theoretically understand mosfet what we see there is a thin layer of gate oxide we say like this right thin layer of gate oxide what is thin layer of gate oxide what is the value right it's around 1 to 10 nanometer around 1 to 10 nanometer we have to understand it it can also vary depending on type of mosfet and with the technology advancement it it is it will change the point is when we learn mosfet when we say thin layer you can always say it is between 1 and 10 nanometer somewhere around this value right so this thin layer of oxides can also be grown using the thermal oxidation using the thermal oxidation what is the next step 1 nanometer to that level 1 nanometer now you understand the the importance of the uh, dimensions i told you one hair one single hair the thickness of one hair human hair is around 80 to 100 microns or 70 to 100 microns microns one mic 1 millimeter 1 millimeter is 1000 microns now what i am saying is human hair is about 70 to 100 micrometers you see and what we are talking about we are talking about 1 nanometer 1 nanometer so it is it is extremely thin extremely thin all right for this we can use as a chemical oxides for from cleaning native oxide so uh, if uh, this is the case if you want to remove the uh, clean the native oxides uh, 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 the chemical oxides from the native oxides uh, we can have thickness of about 1 nanometer. Now, if you talk about deposited oxides this is thermally grown right this is thermally grown oxide another one is deposited oxide. So, what is deposited oxide we, this is thermally grown oxides right and we can see we can vary the thickness of the oxide from 1 nanometer to 1 micron how about i want to deposit the oxide i want to deposit the oxide hmm? so one is back end insulators between metal layers and sti metal layers in in a, 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 a sti so back end insulators between metal layers means if i want to have uh, if i have a metal right and I have to have another metal right then if I want to have some separation I will separate it with uh, 
some oxide material. I will have a separation with the oxide material. So, it can act as a insulating material between two metals you understand in this term ok. You understand in this term that it can act as a insulating layer between two metal layers. And of course, the another uh, uh, operation of this or the use of this deposited oxide is again as masking oxides is again as masking oxides. So, there are two things that we have to remember one is called LP CVD low pressure chemical vapor deposition right low pressure chemical vapor deposition all right low pressure chemical vapor deposition this is carried out at 1150 degree centigrade to 1200 degree centigrade this is to grow grow silicon dioxide grow silicon dioxide thermal grown oxide all right second one is called pecvd so we we'll write somewhere here pecvd plasma p l a s m a plasma enhanced e n h a n c e d enhanced chemical vapor deposition all right plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition p e c v d this can be done from 100 to 400 degree centigrade this can be done from 100 to 400 degree centigrade. That means, the temperature required here was 1150 degree centigrade to 1200 degree centigrade temperature required is between 100 to 400 degree centigrade that is why whenever we have a material which is which is sensitive to temperature or which can get affected by higher temperature in this particular range we can go for plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition all right easy high temperature no, no, no worry about the uh, substance beneath it we can use LPCVD. For example, if we take a silicon we do not worry about silicon nothing will happen to silicon at 1150 to 1200 degree centigrade right. So, we do not really worry that it will get destroyed it will get destroyed no, but if you have a aluminum suppose you have aluminum on aluminum if you want to grow oxide then you cannot grow oxide at 1150 or 1200 degree centigrade aluminum will melt aluminum will melt right you got an example. So, the point is <coughs> there are two types of oxidation one is when we grow it one we when we deposit it one we when we grow it another one is when we deposit it when you grow it you have different uh, uh, application of the growth uh, grown silicon dioxide uh, one is your field oxide another one is masking oxide another one is pad oxides another one is gate oxides or tunneling oxides and the last one is your chemical oxides from chemical native oxides and then finally, you have from cleaning uh, native oxides and finally, you have backhand insulators between metal layers and you have masking oxides all right. So, this is the application of this is the application of silicon dioxide in an IC industry ok. Now, let us move to the next one. So, very good etching selectivity between SI and SiO2 using HF. If I have a silicon dioxide on silicon which is this one and if I dip it in HF I told you we can use buffer hydrofluoric acid or we can use hydrofluoric acid. If we dip it what we will find only silicon, silicon dioxide will get etched SiO2 will get etched without affecting silicon, silicon will not get affected ok, silicon will not get affected ok. Good, now let us move to the next slide, what is next slide? So, 
what are the diffusion mask for common dopants right it can act as a diffusion mask not what are diffusion mask it the silicon dioxide uh, can act as a diffusion mask for common dopants what does it mean you see silicon dioxide so if you have layer right let me show it to you here if i have a layer right you understand my palm is one layer my by this hard drive is another layer so this is silicon and this is silicon dioxide all right so what will happen if i show you this way what will happen the area which is covered by silicon dioxide if i diffuse it if i diffuse it then the area below it area which is by by hand area palm area that is considered as silicon this hard drive as silicon dioxide then the silicon will not get diffused in the area covered by silicon dioxide that means silicon dioxide acts as a mask acts as a mask for the dopant for the dopant the silicon dioxide will act as a mask all right very easy now what kind of common dopants we can use so if you go back to the screen you will find that there are several common dopants that are boron ga phosphorus as sp arsenide right and then you can see silicon dioxide can provide a selective mask against diffusion at high temperature oxides for masking which is about 0.1 to 1 micron here you can see the mask thickness and you can grow the silicon dioxide or uh, uh, for the diffusion for the diffusion time r is there a 900 degree you need this much thickness if you want to have 1200 degree for boron and phosphor bo both is written what is the thickness that is required for the silicon dioxide uh, uh, on this particular silicon right to act as a uh, mask for the dopant the common dopants are the most common dopants are boron and phosphorus right boron and phosphorus to create your n channel and p channel for your mosfets to create your n channel and p channel for your mosfets right that means now we understood that the silicon dioxide is extremely important part when we talk about a mosfet or when we talk about the mosfet all right so let us see the next slide and you see here that the uh, uh, if you if you come back to the slide come back to the slide what do you see here that there are two types of oxidation one is a dry oxidation and another one is a wet oxidation one is a dry oxidation another one is wet oxidation when you talk about dry oxidation when you talk about dry oxidation you have silicon right you have a wafer you have a wafer at very high temperature about 1200 degree centigrade and loaded into a thermal furnace i'll show it to you how the furnace looks like and you pass oxygen you pass oxygen on to the heated wafer which is silicon then the oxygen will react with silicon to form silicon dioxide the oxygen will react with silicon to form silicon dioxide and you see here we have used oxygen directly we have not used water vapor right that means we have used a dry oxidation technique we have used a dry oxidation technique but if i have the silicon wafer at high temperature in the horizontal tube furnace i have a silicon at the high temperature in the horizontal tube furnace and if i inject the oxygen in forms of water vapor that means i take a uh, oxygen i pass it through the bubbler in which water is there and it is heated so the water vapor will be carried to my uh, to my silicon water vapor would be carried to my silicon in that case i have silicon reacting with what is water vapor h2o right is a finally it is h2o so when i uh, balance my equation what will i have silicon plus 2h2o will give us sio2 plus 2h2 right so this is this technique is called wet oxidation wet oxidation this technique is called dry oxidation that means now we know two types of oxidation one is dry oxidation one is wet oxidation all right so let us go to the next slide uh, the next part of this particular slide and that is that both of this oxidations are done at 900 to 1200 degree centigrade both of these oxidation are carried out at 900 to 1200 degree centigrade but wet oxidation is about 10 times faster wet oxidation is about 10 times faster than dry oxidation right so the dry oxidation where it is used where it is used okay these are the application of dry oxidation and wet oxidation first you understand dry oxide dry oxide about thin 0.05 to 0.5 micron is an excellent insulator is an excellent insulator for gate oxides 
for very thin gate oxides uh, we may have to add the nitrogen to form oxynitrides to form oxynitrides. Now, uh, 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 we do not have to worry about this particular uh, the complexity of the wet oxidation. What we understand is the oxide can be used if it is a dry oxidation we can use it for the gate oxides and if it is a wet oxidation then the thickness will be less than 2.5 micron, but it is thick greater than 0.5 micron. Then it is a good insulator for field oxides one for masking second but the disadvantage of wet oxidation disadvantage of wet oxidation is that the quality of the oxide suffers due to diffusion of the hydrogen gas out of the film which creates path that electron can flow which create path that electron can flow that means if i want to have a thin layer of oxide gate oxide gate oxide then i cannot use wet oxidation i cannot use wet oxidation because it may have the pinholes through which the electron can flow and this pinholes are created by the hydrogen gas coming out of the film. Because now you have Si plus 2 H 2 O gives Si O 2 plus 2 H 2 right. So, uh, in, in the case of gate oxide we should go for dry oxidation in the case of filled oxide or the masking oxides we can use the wet oxidation alright. So, let us go to the next part of this slide. Now, room temperature silicon creates in air creates a native oxide. So, if you just keep the silicon in room temperature you will find that there is a thin layer of oxide which is grown which is extremely poor insulator, but can imp impede the surface processing of silicon that means it will affect the processing of silicon that means that we have to we have to always start when you have a substrate dip it in HF for 5 to 10 seconds then you clean it and then you start the process do not directly take a silicon and start working under oxide uh, growing of oxide. Because what we understand is that even the silicon is at room temperature it will form extremely thin layer of oxide which is poor insulator, but can impede the process alright. So, that means that whenever you take a ox silicon wafer always dip it for 5 to 10 seconds and then you process it further. <coughs> now, you can see volume expansion of this one is nothing but 2 by 2 times 1 by 0.46. So, SiO2 has nothing but a compressive stress, SiO2 has compressive stress. So, this is just the understanding how we can have thickness by say a thickness of silicon by thickness of silicon dioxide and we find that when we calculate it is about 0 0.46, 0 0.46 alright. Now, what next we have see? We have to see the thermal oxidation methods, thermal oxidation methods. First is your dry oxidation, second is your wet oxidation, third one is your pyogenic oxidation, third one is your pyogenic oxidation. In all the cases what we see one thing common is there is a furnace, there is a horizontal tube furnace. You see the tube is in horizontal direction that is why it is called horizontal tube furnace. If tube is in vertical direction, vertical direction, vertical tube furnace, tube in horizontal direction, horizontal tube furnace. So, one thing is clear that we require a horizontal tube furnace, second is it is a furnace. So, it should be at high temperature if it is wobbler involved wet oxidation, wobbler is not involved dry oxidation. This is how the system will look like, this is how the system will look like. So, uh, what we see here is first one is a three tube horizontal tube furnace. There are three tubes 1, 2 and 3 that you can load inside, you can load inside here right and another one is your vertical furnace, vertical furnace which you can see that it is in vertical direction. But the point is that vertical furnace is not so popular and horizontal furnace is the extremely popular furnace to grow the silicon dioxide to grow the silicon dioxide. And in this horizontal furnace there is a three zone uh, temperature like this you will say zone 1, zone 2, zone 3, zone 1, zone 2, zone 3 right. So, that is why it is called three tube zone, three tube horizontal furnace with multi zone temperature control, multi zone. So, Z 1, Z 2, Z 3 we can control the zone temperature individually control the zone temperature individually. That is not really uh, part of uh, uh, detailed part of this particular uh, course. So, we do not worry about it we just understand that for growing the silicon dioxide we can use horizontal tube furnace this particular technique this particular technique is also called uh, LPCVD 
is also called LPCVD. You can actually see now uh, uh, that a person is loading right engineer is loading the wafer uh, you can see here set of wafers loaded into the furnace loaded into the furnace this is how horizontal furnace or tube furnace looks like. We have taken this image from uh, uh, the lecture given by uh, uh, professor B C Y and uh, he is from Waterloo. Uh, so, I have taken this particular image from his slide and uh, you can see the, the, the point was that I wanted you to see uh, you can also see his slides his presentation uh, that will also help you to understand further silicon dioxide, but that is all about silicon dioxide. I just wanted to take a part where you can click fast understand uh, how the thermal oxide is grown. All right. So, that is why we have taken this particular slide and here you can see very clearly that you have the uh, uh, you have the holder for the silicon wafers and then you, you can see the temperature is extremely high right around 1100 to 1200 degrees centigrade and you have to load the furnace inside the uh, in, uh, you have to load the wafer inside the horizontal tube furnace. Okay. So, you can see here uh, there is a silicon rod through which you can push the wafer you can you have to push the wafer inside it can be done using the silicon rod by which you can push the wafer. And then you have a heating coils you can have a gas inlet here and this is generally a quartz tube this is generally a quartz tube quartz can take a very high temperature quartz can take very high temperature. So, you can see here the tubular reactor made out of a quartz or glass heated by the resistance resistance is nothing but your heating coils oxygen or water vapor flows through the reactor and pass the silicon wafers with typical velocity of 1 centimeter per second this is the velocity of the uh, water vapor that we can pass uh, through the silicon wafers loaded inside the horizontal tube furnace. So, now uh, this is the uh, uh, this is how we can grow we can grow the thermal oxide. So, guys I, I, I hope that you understand what we have studied today uh, what we have studied if we quickly see once again our slides if we quickly see once again our slides we have seen the <coughs> application of SiO2 right I have shown you two examples where we can use uh, the silicon dioxide one is a biosensor that we have seen another one is a BAMP based sensor that we have seen and we in both the cases we have used the silicon dioxide. Then I have shown you the uh, application of silicon dioxide in IC industry whether, whether it is thermally grown oxide or it is deposited oxide and by changing the thickness we can apply it for several layers including fill oxide, masking oxide, gate oxide, pad oxides and so on and so forth. We know that the silicon dioxide can be etched using hydrofluoric acid then we have seen that how uh, uh, silicon dioxide can mask can act as a mask for the diffusion for common dopants and we have seen the common dopants here the most uh, frequently used dopants are boron and phosphorus then we have seen uh, the dioxidation we have seen how the dioxidation and oxidations are different how it can be used in which particular case we have to use dioxidation when you have gate oxides thin layer of oxides because wet oxidation creates a path for the electron. Uh, that can flow and cause a problem in your circuit that is why we cannot use the uh, wet oxidation for the gate oxide for the wet oxidation can be used for the filled oxides. Then we have seen that uh, uh, the SiO2 is compressive then we have calculated the compressive uh, if you have thickness of silicon over thickness of silicon dioxide how you can measure the uh, uh, mo uh, molecular volume by molecular SiO2 we have seen this equation and we found that it is nothing but equals to 0.46. Then we have seen the thermal oxidation methods, we have seen horizontal tube furnace and we have seen vertical tube furnace and finally, we have seen the uh, photograph of how the engineer is loading the wafer uh, inside the horizontal tube furnace. We, we found that the tube is made up of quads, we also found that the, the gas inlet uh, uh, we can in, we can induce the gas from here, we can have heating coils and we can have the silicon rod to push the wafer further inside the furnace. Now, in the next class what we will see in the next class we will see how PECVD can be used quickly then we will move on to the, the deposition technique because uh, in your MOSFET right you have to deposit some metal how we will deposit this metal until now what we have seen we have seen substrate silicon then we have seen oxide oxide is also there in MOSFET. Now, we are what you have to see we have to see the metal contact we do the contact in the MOSFET and then we will see uh, uh, lithography quickly right and finally, we will see how you can uh, understand the process flow for the MOSFET.
all right so with that i hope that you today you understood uh, application of uh, uh, the thermal oxide uh, in the in the mosfet in particular we have seen gate oxides and field oxides and you also now know that the uh, thermal oxidation can be done by wet oxidation or wet oxidation technique and dry oxidation technique all right so read about it again like i said until we reach the mosfet uh, until we finish the mosfet uh, process flow uh, have some patience right read it when you reach to mosfet process flow and you have any question you can you can uh, ask me uh, or ask the ta and uh, we will get you back with your uh, with a possible solution for your curiosity or for your questions all right till then you take care and i'll see you in the next class